the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is there's, we do have some templates and activities for the practice because there's, there's different, um, different templates out there. There's no one right way of, of doing it. This is a template that I use to track temperatures. This is a twice daily. So it's actually got morning temperatures and afternoon temperatures. And the way it works is you can see here it's got month, year, and then it's got the date. It's already got all the numbers in there. You don't need to know if it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or whatever it is. So if, for instance, if it's January, we just put January 2013. And then 1st of Jan, this is where we start uh, recording current, minimum, maximum, put initials or any comments if we did any restocking or anything. Now, what would we do if it's a, a weekend and the clinic is closed? Close. Yeah, just write closed and write it across so that you know that you didn't miss that temperature. That was just that the clinic was closed and we didn't need to, to take it. The, um, I particularly like, the, and it's got the, the, the contact number for the Department of Health at the bottom should there be a breach. The reason why I like this setup is you can either keep track of it, obviously by hand, and then scan them in or just keep them in a folder. Or you can, uh, at one of my clinics, we have this, but we do it in the computer. So we actually have the, uh, as a Word document, and just put it straight into the, the computer file. That way, it's backed up with the, when the server does a, a backing up. The, what I've seen sometimes is you just put in, it, this just has blanks, and you put in the date. So today is the 15th of the 5th. Of, one of the, the issues with that is if we're just putting in the date and the measurement, it's very difficult to see if there were dates missing. Yeah, because it's, it's a lot more difficult to see 15, 16, 22, yeah? Whereas here, if you're going by that line, it's very quick and easy to see there were two days missing. Why were they missing? Was it a weekend? That's fine then. Or was the practice closed? That's fine then, okay? It's a very quick and easy way of, of measuring. There's also where they do the, the dots, where you track, put the minimum and the maximum. The now, again, there's no problem with that. I personally like this better because you can put the exact temperature. It's more accurate. So you can go if it was a 2.5 or if it was a 5.8, instead of just trying to put the dot in the right, yeah. Especially if it starts getting towards the lower end, you want to get really accurate readings. This template I can uh, make available to you. I can email it to you. So you've all got my cards um, on the front, of the front of your pack. So you send me an email. That way I'll have your email and just request that template. There is one for once daily, but again, now we're, because the, the guidelines are changing to really push for twice daily, this is the one that I'm going to be sending out. And you can't really see it very well, but here at the bottom, it's got a legend. If you want to use abbreviations of um, uh, vaccine or stop rotated or stop ordered, so you can just use SO or um, or um, thermometer checked or yeah. So then you can put that in the comments along with the initials and keep keep track of it that way. You really have two of those, like one for the actual fridge, the one that's do you know the one that we're testing and resetting each day, and then you recommend having one with a loose. Now, what I, would, what I would say is you only really need one. So you would have one of these sheets per fridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So one of these sheets per fridge. I would recommend having a loose thermometer, which is yeah. just your backup, but you don't have to keep track of that one oh. as well. That's just to make sure if, if the reading of that thermometer is wildly different from the reading on your fridge, that's a concern. Yeah? Also, that thermometer is good to take out if, you, if, you do a, if you're doing visits or doing immunization offsite, or you can use it for... Um, to monitor your cooler in the case of, um, of a power outage where you're yeah. having to move yeah, vaccines. The other thing is when I went around um, and I did the interview with many other practices, everybody had a policy and procedure around cold chain because that's a requirement. And most people had an induction checklist for new staff. And it includes cold chain as one of the things that you cover. But what we did in, in one of our clinics is we actually put together a one-page training sheet for all staff, which is used to take the induction checklist when a new staff comes in. And yes, we've trained them on cold chain. We also get that, that explains, or this is how we, when we go through the maximum, minimum temperature of the thermometer, how it works, why it's important, what range 
we're looking for. This is the sheet that we use. It also states that whoever opens the clinic in the morning and whoever closes, uh, this is, you know this is going to be your responsibility to check the temperatures. It doesn't take that long, so it shouldn't really be an inconvenience. And at the bottom, it's got uh, a, an area for staff to sign and date. This piece of paper now becomes evidence of in-house training for accreditation. You know how we often struggle to have um, training for, especially for admin staff? Because we can often send the nursing staff off and um, do um, training and things like that, but often it's only just CPR that our admin staff have done. You can actually have this done not just when new staff come in, you can do it as a refresher. Do it once every year. Yeah? Yeah, so just email me and I'll email it to you. It's actually part of a set of training sheets, so it includes things like privacy and confidentiality, infection control, it's got templates for everything, so I'll, I'll just send you the whole thing. And then you can put your own logo and modify it to suit your policy and procedure. And these are some of the resources. So we have the Strive for Five, which you can access. If you actually just Google Strive for Five, you will find... Um, yeah, if you Google Strive for Five, it, the, usually the first link that comes up will take you to the PDF. And that's the website where you'll be able to order the physical copy. This is the phone number for Immunize Australia, the Department of Health, and our website, which is you know, one of the ways that you can contact me. Now, I just wanted to have... Now, that's the core. That's, that's essentially it for our talk on cold chain management. Are there any areas, or is there anything that you, any questions or any areas that we haven't covered that you'd like to discuss a bit more? No. Nothing's coming up? No? Is there any specific vaccines that should be put in particular spots? Like, have you got any recommendations for that? Yeah, so the question is, are there any particular vaccines that we should be putting in any particular spots? From the information that you've had today, what would your, what would your guess be or your answer be? With MMR, you said. MMR, yeah, it's more freeze resistant, so that's okay. So you can put it towards the colder. But you've got to know which is the cold. But you have to know where, where in your fridge is the coldest spot and where are your hot spots. Because it varies from fridge to fridge. Some fridges will be colder at the top, some fridges will be colder at the bottom. Yeah? Yeah. So it's a good idea if I know that my. Say, for instance, if I have a, a, a domestic fridge mm -hmm. and I know that my bottom shelf tends to sit probably two degrees colder than the top, but my, my, um, my probe, the, the probe of my thermometers tend to sit at the top, then I know because I'm more paranoid about this going freezing, mm -hmm. I'm probably going to want to move that probe down to my highest risk area mm -hmm. so that I know that I'm covering myself. There's a buffer of safety. Yeah? More difficult to do with a purpose-built fridge because you can't really move the probe, the thermometer, you can't really move the position. That's why having a, a free-flowing, free-moving thermometer as a backup, which again is not that expensive, it's only about $40 or $50, um, can be a good way of just getting to know your fridge. And it's very quick because you can just check Put it in, leave it for a moment so that it gets to the temperature of the fridge and check if my bottom shelf, the temperature that it's saying on the thermometer is the same that my purpose-built fridge is saying. Yeah? So there's, there's different, different ways. If you're wanting support with, you know, if you have data loggers or if you're looking to purchase loggers and you want support with how to use them, I'm more than happy to, to provide support with that. Because in a lot of them, it's, they're very relatively straightforward. You'd install the software in your computer, they connect via USB and then you can program to say yeah I want to do it for a week or three days or something like that. Now I want to show you really quickly, I don't think we've loaded that other one, because um, what we are going to do now, well in the afternoon there's a couple of, the, some of the practices are going to be staying back because we have an additional component of, um, uh, what do you call it, more intensive um, sort of activity around cold, cold chain. But what I wanted to show you is we, we, that interview that I said that we did with, um, with these practices, we got some data and so I just wanted to show you the, 
the aggregated data. It's obviously not, not, it's confidential. It's not identifying who's what and what did what. But just to get a bit of an idea of what's happening in our area and where your practice may sit in relation to that, the things that we were measuring are how many, we, we had a look at the past 10 months at their record, the temperature record sheets, and we had a look and see how many temperature days were missed when they should have been done, so when it wasn't a weekend or when it was just an issue, and how many data loggings, if they were doing data loggings, or audits were done. So the ones that you see in the green are the ones that had less than five days missed, from zero to five days missed per month. Yeah, so that's from the June, July, so this is all last year, the last, last 10 months up until March. So most practices had, yeah, so seven practices, nine, 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 nine eight, seven, had less than zero to five dates missed where they didn't record the temperatures. And then we only really had one in different months that didn't record between six and 10 times, so it's between six and 10 days were missed, and then, then it varied here between one and three practices, didn't record, didn't have records for more than 10 days in those months, yeah? So this is a good one to, to take back to your practice now, and obviously you don't have this slide, but you have now a bit of an idea. Take back to your practice, have a look through your, through your last 10 months and go, how many have we missed? Can we even find those sheets? Because that was one of the things, some places, Either you couldn't find the sheet, and if you can't find it, it's almost as good as not, not having done it. Yeah. So if you can't find it, that's a concern. Because what happens if you get, you know, you get a parent coming in going, look, you had my child was immunized for this, and now here they are presenting symptoms, and they had their full dose, um, their full regime. How could this be? I think it's because you gave my child a, a vaccine that was um, not um, uh, viable. Yeah. This is just as medical legally um, important as your other records. So all your vaccine temperature records is like sterilization records. It's your only way to prove that, no, look, we are, all, all our procedures are to make sure that when we administer a vaccine, it's viable and it's going to protect you yeah? in as much as the, the vaccine is going to be able to do it. And then we also had a look at data loggings or, or audits that happen. So this is either because the practice had a, a data logger and did a, a logging, or because um, they did an audit, that 12 month audit. Now this is in each month. The bulk of the practices didn't do either a logging or, a, or a, an audit. Then we had between one and two practices did one a month. And then only, again, one or two did more than one. We actually had practices that are doing the weekly download of the data logging. So they would actually have four data loggings each month. Yeah? Now remember, what's required is just doing one audit in the year. That's the requirement. <coughs> but this here, these guys up here, where they're doing a download, and they have evidence of it, because so you, you have to keep them a record of it if you're going to be doing it and counting it. These guys up here, um, are doing the once a week. So they have the backup of if something happens and the, the temperature says that it reached 15, 17, we can quickly look back on our logger and say, oh, no, it was fine. It was only for 10 minutes or however. Or, or actually, that was, it was out of range for three hours, four hours. 